I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. That has led to the whole cry of racism, because it's not only... Um, do you see people who are supporting, or many of Trump's supporters are kind of known racist, and I agree with the point that just because they support you doesn't mean you support them back, but then you have Trump giving that clue that is somewhat disturbing. Yeah, that's exactly why it disturbed me. Look, I, I know Donald Trump. Uh, he's not a racist. He's just not. I, I wouldn't support him if he was, but beyond that, you know, the the you just... If you know him, you just know that he's not um, in a way that's that's very hard to spell out in uh, in a way to people who don't know him. You just you kind of know among your friends and among the people you know who who secretly harbors hatred in their heart, and he doesn't. Do you mind if I ask you just stupid questions about politics for a little bit? I've seen criticisms um, where people say, "Okay, there was Trump the candidate, and now we're supposed to believe that Trump the president is going to be a lot different." Where do you think there's going to be the biggest disconnect between what he said before the election and what happens afterwards? All right, so I'm here with Ken Curson, editor-in-chief of the New York Observer. Uh, Ken, welcome back to the show. Just even being back here as a returning guest, I I feel like David Brenner on The Tonight Show uh, to to come back twice. And to be fair, you were here... Two and a half years ago. I feel like, it feels like yesterday, but I've been doing this podcast for a long time now. You were one of my first guests. This podcast has grown tremendously. I I barely knew what a podcast was the first time I was on. And now uh, podcasts are huge. And this podcast in particular is one to which a lot of uh, aspiring podcasters uh, cite as an example. Well, well, thank you for saying so. And um, you're on for a very important reason today, in addition to being a friend of the show. And by the way, also... uh, uh, your brother has been on the show, uh, Robert Curson, when he wrote his his last book, was such a, such an excellent book, and he was a great guest here as well. But um, I wanted to talk to you about an issue that's pressing the nation. Of course, it, it like it actually. I've never seen any one topic other than nine eleven hog the news cycle so much as Donald Trump getting elected president, and of course. You've been ground zero on this back in April. Uh, you wrote one of the first editorials, uh, you know, where a newspaper endorsed Donald Trump. And of course, you took a a lot of heat and a lot of controversy. And so I want to ask you about that. I want to ask you more about Trump. But I want to ask, do you mind if I ask you just stupid questions about politics for a little bit? James, you can ask me anything you like. So, So you've been a campaign manager for Rudy Giuliani. I've been very apolitical. I've even written articles uh, that they should abolish the presidency. So I'm totally naive about politics and everything. But this is naive question number one. And and then I want to ask what you think Trump will do in his four or eight years or whatever. But naive question number one is, why do newspapers, which are 
we generally think of them as supposed to be unbiased and you know fact driven and news driven. Why do they endorse? candidates for political office at all, president or even city council? Why, why does a newspaper endorse a candidate? Well, that's that's traditionally been the, the uh, reason newspapers exist, is to have a point of view. So the... I didn't know that, to be honest. Yeah, That's the, why this is a naive question. The objectivity you describe, uh, there, there is uh, supposed to be, in an ideal world, there is a separation between the, uh, the news gathering, the, uh, the reporting, um, and the opinion, uh, which which takes place uh, both in unsigned editorials, which represent the publisher's point of view, and in signed editorials that usually appear on the opposite page and are thus called op-eds, and letters to the editor and stuff like that. That all occurs in the opinion section. That's supposed to be separated from the, the straight reporting. Um, it would be my contention that, that that's always been mostly a fiction. There has always, you know, people are human beings, and reporters bring their own biases to their reporting, and and those biases seep into um, their uh, "quote unquote" objective reporting. I'm, I'm making air quotes, but your listeners can't see me <laughs> drawing those with my hands. Um, and on the other hand, uh, a good editorial should should not just be somebody's opinion as he sits on his couch, but he ought to be a talented enough reporter to gather facts and do some reporting to inform his opinion. So these things are not as pure. They never have been as pure, and. Um, uh, I don't think they ought to be. I, th- I think that you you consume the news from other human beings. You consume it from a variety of sources, and it's it's a it's a good thing if uh, if those if the news is informed by by someone's judgment. Um, what I do think is important is that you disclose to the best of your ability where those biases might be coming from. So my paper, for example, which is published by Jared Kushner, who is the son-in-law of Donald Trump, we we disclose anytime we mention Donald Trump positively or negatively. We disclose that uh, this relationship, and people can people can read it and go, "Well, I don't believe this at all because it's the son-in-law." Or they can say, "Okay, they've told me what it's about, and I'll try and pay attention to the facts." And, and to be fair, like I've noticed recently, um, the the paper actually has been uh, ha- has reported both negative and positive things about Donald Trump, particularly uh, since I, I think initially you got some heat for for. Um, your support of Trump, and even for your involvement in your slight involvement in the campaign, like you helped write one of the speeches, you were at the Republican National Convention with the the Trump family, um, and I've seen since then um, articles on both sides of kind of the Trump candidacy and then election. Uh, uh, since then, I guess was that strategic? Must have been. Uh, we always reported uh, both sides on Trump. That's that's a fiction that that only happened in reaction to something. In fact, we we broke some stories that were that were hurtful to like the what? Trump campaign. Like uh, our reporter Will Bretterman broke the story that uh, uh, the Trump campaign's New York State chair uh, had uh, had questioned um, whether the president is a Muslim, which was very harmful, you know, in this uh, effort to cast uh, cast aside some of these these sort of you know birther stuff. Um, we ran very tough editorials uh, and opinion pieces against Donald Trump. Our, our columnist, John Reinish, who is a Democratic operative, uh, wrote some searing uh, anti-Trump columns. And then we ran what, what might be the most famous anti-Trump opinion column of the entire election when our staffer, Dana Schwartz, wrote uh, uh, an open letter um, saying that the campaign, including our publisher, was ignoring uh, dog whistles to anti-Semites. So the entire time we ran very tough stuff. But... What makes us different is we also ran positive stuff, and that's what you know. Virtually every paper in the United States um, either treated this candidacy like a total joke. You had like the Huffington Post, for example, putting in the entertainment section or running this absolutely ridiculous and stupid and embarrassing disclaimer at the end, uh, saying um, you know this this guy's a carnival barker or whatever they said. They had some really over the top, hilarious insider language of the of the variety I, I despise. Um, so the fact that we were taking his candidacy seriously and covering it as news organizations should have been um, from both sides uh, is to our credit, not to our detriment. It seems like Trump is the first candidate ever to kind of skip the media process and go straight to the people. Like he went, like his Twitter feed, of course, blew up while he was running, and the guy was tweeting at three in the morning, and people say it was. Maybe sometimes irresponsibly, but I give I do give him credit for trying to go directly to people as opposed to talking to to people through reporters. Well, you're right to give him credit. He deserves credit for it. I, I think that what you had here is a a really stark dynamic of a, a candidate who, while arguably undisciplined, was clearly 
operating his own, you know, expressing his own thoughts. When when somebody tweets at three or four in the morning, um, filled with misspellings and stuff, you can complain about what he tweets, but there's no doubt that you're you're getting the authentic opinions of the guy who will lead the country. On the other hand, you had this very experienced, extremely polished, and to many uh, over managed uh, candidate who didn't give a news conference for uh, you know a couple hundred days. And it, it was almost impossible to imagine Hillary Clinton saying something that, that wasn't rehearsed and poll tested and, and screened through a bunch of uh, campaign professionals. So, so let, let me, um, let me uh, ask you about two of the things you just said. One is, um, you know, wakes up at three in the morning and potentially puts these undisciplined tweets out there. Do we want a president who could potentially be undisciplined at three in the morning? Yeah, that, that three in the morning um, campaign ad that Hillary Clinton ran against Barack Obama is uh, is what you're referring to, and I think it's it's fair to ask that. I but I don't think no, that, but I'm also referring to Trump's. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. You're yeah. you're, you're saying if Trump uh, sh- shoots from the hip at three in the morning, his tweets will he shoot from the hip at three in the morning when he's got the nuclear codes and uh, someone irritates him, which I, is like what my daughters, for instance, are afraid of. Um, I. I don't think, first of all, I don't know how Donald Trump will be president. Nobody knows. He, you can't say, well, he was this kind of mayor and that kind of governor, so he'll probably be this kind of president. He, he, hasn't, uh, he hasn't done those kind of public service roles, so, so I don't know. Um, but I will, I will say that nobody governs like the campaign. Um, you know, there, you, you say and do things in campaign mode, and then you, uh, with the benefit of... Uh, intelligence briefings and advisors and the the understanding of the the stakes of the game you you govern differently and that doesn't make you a hypocrite that's just it makes you a leader well you know it's interesting because i agree with you in fact i think probably every president in history has campaigned under um different philosophies than they ultimately governed with i mean you go back to um i mean definitely uh there there's a lot of campaign promises from both Obama and Bush before him where they almost did the opposite when they became president. But uh, with with Trump, it seems so calculated. Like, this was a very modern campaign. I mean, I think it's the only campaign I know of where the guy who spent less than his opponent won. I can't think of another campaign like that. I mean, he spent half of what Hillary spent. Yeah, there there have been other instances of of people spending a lot less and winning when they're up against uh, jillionaire candidates. But this this was a really stark difference, which you don't usually get in presidential politics. It's usually pretty balanced. But Hillary spent about six hundred twenty five. Uh, Trump spent about three hundred, and then her, PAC supporting her spent three times as much as PAC supporting him. Um, so if you're looking to how someone will will run the thing, you, you got to look toward the you know cost per vote as some sort of efficiency measure. And on that score, he he just uh, he trounced her. Well, well again, um, where where he was disciplined and where he ran a very different campaign from most people, and a kind of um, what what I would call the modern campaign of the 21st century. You had Jared Kushner, who owns the New York Observer. He essentially um, kind of spearheaded this idea of heavily targeting and polling via social media and then, you know, targeting much cheaper ads across social media to Trump or potential Trump supporters and also to figure out what issues resonated most with potential Trump supporters. And I think, uh, again, I wonder with um, this is sort of a different type of polling, you know, using social media to kind of figure out where your support is and what they stand for and so on. Uh, is did Trump do too much of this in order to basically say what he thought people wanted to hear so simply so that he could win his votes? Well, I mean, trying to win votes is sort of the job of a of any candidate. I, I don't think that that's malpractice to <laughs> try and get right. the most votes. That's that's kind of the point. But uh, I I think that that the spending that that Jared and Brad Parscale and some of the other guys on on this team uh, evidence was was pretty ingenious. I, I spent a long time doing politics for a living. And uh, they broke a lot of the so-called rules, but they did it with a, a real strategy. So, for example, you, you talk about how they were buying cheaper online instead of television ads. They, they did spend a lot on television. Um, and uh, my former firm, Jamestown Associates, actually did uh, 70% of the ads they did. But they did it in an unconventional way. For example, um, their, their sort of closing argument ad was a two-minute spot. That's very expensive to buy. So they only bought it a lot. You know, you buy two minutes instead of 30-second spots. But that two-minute spot became the most watched spot 
uh, on YouTube of the entire campaign. It was clicked over 8 million times. So that, that was kind of a multiplier effect um, that, that those guys running the, the media of Donald Trump's campaign uh, were, able to, were able to perform. Um, and as for polling, you know, I, I, just, I just think not nearly enough has been said about the way Clinton's campaign failed to see some of the trends that were happening, that, that she did not visit the state of Wisconsin a single time after the primary there is some sort of campaign malpractice. I mean, you, you saw how close it turned out to be, and you, you got to think she could have picked up 10,000, 20,000 votes um, with, with a little more effort there. So I, I, I think it was a combination of uh, Trump doing things very differently and doing things his own way, and Hillary Clinton's uh, team simply uh, relying on what they were reading in the, the New York Times and the Washington Post about her invincibility. So, so, but what happened there behind the scenes? Like when you, when you were on the podcast two and a half years ago, you actually thought there was a chance Hillary might not run because of uh, uh, an unannounced illness, and of course that became the rumor later on in the campaign, particularly after the conventions. What's what's the scoop? Like what's what's going on? Yeah, I got to brag a little bit. I listened to our podcast. I hate <laughs> listening to myself. Uh, I do too. <laughs> on, on, on old things. I, I will not watch myself because I, I seem to get fatter by the moment. But Not true. You, you, I think you're in excellent uh, shape right now. Thanks, James. You, you having bought me two or three milkshakes over the past year <laughs> doesn't help. But um, uh, even listening to myself is torture. But I will say that on that podcast, not only did I say that I thought her health would become an issue in this campaign. It was two and a half years ago. But I said I would not be surprised if a... a far-left populist candidate capitalized on the discontent the nation was feeling and gave her a real hard time. Now, that's a great call. I mean, this was before Bernie Sanders was on anybody's radar. I'm very proud to have said that on your show. Right. Um, I did not predict the the incredible, stunning rise of Donald Trump, but uh, I I did feel that populism was in the air. Um, And I said it on your program, and I'm real proud of that. So, you know, I, I don't know that the the health issue that Hillary was clearly struggling with. I mean, you know, you'll remember right here in New York, she she passed out and had to be helped to her feet right. and cancel a bunch of events. So that wasn't just pure white right wing uh, crap. That 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 was real. Um, but I don't think that the some of the discontent was about health per se. But I do think this feeling that she was tired and vulnerable and old fed into this uh, right track wrong track um, question. So to me, when I was in politics. I didn't pay too much attention to what's called the horse race number. This this candidate's at 46, that candidate's at 42. I paid much more attention to two questions, which were, do you think we're on the right track or the wrong track? And do you prefer a strong leader or someone who shares your values? And those two questions pointed strongly to a, a, a win from a, a challenger. Hillary Clinton was, in the minds of the electorate, the incumbent. So when she started to, to look... Um, uh, sort of exhausted and not show up in public and not talk to the press and then pass out, that that fed into a narrative that uh, we're tired of more of the same. Whereas Donald Trump, you know, throwing these giant rallies uh, and, and shouting and screaming, getting his audience all riled up, that pointed to change. And th- this was a, there are some times when the electorate wants to stay the course and there are some times when they want change and this electorate wanted change. Well, and and again, I, I I've seen criticisms which I think are unfair of of just just like I saw criticisms of Hillary that I think were unfair, but I've seen I've seen criticisms um, where people say, okay, there was Trump the candidate, and now we're supposed to believe that Trump the president is going to be a lot different. And again, as you mentioned earlier, that almost every or probably every presidential candidate has been different after they become president. But how Trump was so targeted, depending on which group he was talking to, what he would say. Where do you think there's going to be the biggest disconnect between what he said before the election and what happens afterwards? Given that we don't really know what's going to happen, but where, where do you see the potential biggest disconnects happening? You know, I, I really couldn't say. I think in some ways he is going to do everything he said. I think we're already seeing that um, with regards to, for for example, Russia. That, um, uh, you know, Trump basically promised and said, what would be so wrong with, with having better relationships with Russia? And his reaction to this stunning news, um, and uh, to me, it's, it's beyond the shadow of a doubt that that Russia played a role in hacking uh, the DNC. And his, you know, sort of, uh, you know, so what reaction shows that there is he is going to follow through on this uh, um, different kind of relationship with Russia. On the other hand, I think there has been a softening of some views um, with regards to immigration, for example. It, you know, it went from yeah, we're going to get all 13 million. Uh, 
undocumented and round them up and ship them off to more like, well, let's look at the the ones with criminal records first. And that's obviously a, a, a much, much tinier sliver. How, um, how do you do that? How do you look at the ones with criminal records? Because we don't really know what, what their records are in, in other countries. Well, you know, I don't know how the Trump administration will pursue this policy. If you're asking my opinion uh, about it, um, I think that that's pretty easy. A lot of a lot of these so-called sanctuary cities, for example, we're sitting in one right this second, um, have have asked people to sign up and say, uh, you know, we'll protect you. And to me, that's that's outrageous. You you can't you can't say we're going to protect you from the reach of of the the top law enforcement officer of the of the United States, a constitutionally uh, assigned enforcement branch of the United States. So if if there are lawbreakers. Um, you know, convicted, uh, hopefully start with the felons who have been given some sort of quasi-amnesty in sanctuary cities, um, then I think the federal government can apply all kinds of pressure uh, to these cities to to let them know who they are, and they ought to do that. Like what will happen? Like let's, let's take New York City, for instance. What could Trump do? Well, I would hope that, that if there are f- felons who are here illegally, they would be deported and be sent back to wherever they came from. Um, and and how do you define felon? Felon here or felon where they came from? No, fel- felon here. Okay, uh, someone who's committed a felon, a felony within the the United States. And isn't it? Uh, wh- why weren't they deported before? Again, I'm I'm asking naive questions. But if someone w- is illegally here and then committed a felony, why are they put in jail here and not just deported back to their country? Well, James, that's a, you're actually touching on something that's that's not well known because Barack Obama is so beloved. By the people who usually get incensed about um, immigration uh, matters, that one of the the little discussed facts is that Barack Obama has been uh, very aggressive about deporting um, deporting people here illegally, much more so than than his two predecessors. So that that's not something you'll you'll hear all the time, but but it happens to be the truth. Um, but even given that, it's just an overwhelming task, and the the federal government has decided to starve the. Uh, the authorities, the INS, are responsible with it from the resources they, they need to do it. And then it's also a depressing test because literally sometimes you send these people home, they've, they've done something horrible, in some cases served a jail sentence, get, serve their sentence, get sent back, and then days later are, are back in the country through this porous border. So it's, it's not just one element. You can't just say, okay, we're just going to ship these people home if you have not enough security to keep them, keep them home or keep them out once, they're, once they've been ejected. So I feel... Um I want to. I kind of want to hit a, bu- a bunch of different issues, and maybe. And everybody's got their issues that are important to them, and of course, everyone has their beliefs, and they're not going to line up a hundred percent with whoever's going to be president or whoever your favorite candidate is. But an issue that oddly is important to me is tariffs, and I sort of feel like a lot of small businesses that I talk to are really afraid of Trump putting high tariffs in China. Because so many, like, let's say, I mean, we live here in in New York, there's the garment district, so many small business owners who own clothing companies get their goods from China, and if it's too expensive, they're out of business, or or costs go way up. It's it's not necessarily going to be linked to higher wages or more jobs for Americans if you put tariffs on uh, Chinese goods, or or any goods for that matter. The Chinese are... uh... I, I this is an area where I completely agree with Donald Trump um, and disagree with with you and your your worried friends about the cost of goods. Um, the Chinese have put millions and millions of Americans out of work. They've decimated the uh, middle class, the manufacturing class of this country. Um, and worse than that, they they are chronic cheaters um, in every kind of way. It's not just a currency, which is is universally, not just widely, but universally understood to be manipulated to their benefit. But it's in subtle ways. For example, I'm uh, a very avid uh, uh, follower of Bitcoin. Um, and the Chinese now have set up uh, Bitcoin mining farms that are either subsidized by the government or uh, you know, sort of wink and nod subsidized so that their electricity costs are so low, not to mention that they're using the, the most polluting kinds of, of electricity. It's pure coal there. And seven eighths of the world's uh, bitcoins that are being mined today are mined in China. This I is did a, not know that. This is a devastating scare to the people who you know. It's a small community, but it's a it's a growing community. That that you know, all you need is fifty one percent of the mining, and you can you can shut down that market totally if you just decide you will not accept a trade. Uh, that the majority will not accept a trade, then then the trade doesn't happen. This is very scary. So it's not just a, a you know a government manipulating its own currency. It's that the government so supports industries that compete with uh, with others around the world 
that they quasi subsidize all kinds of industries. So I think your friends who don't want to pay uh, you know more than ninety nine cents for a pair of socks ought to consider their the Americans who have been put out of work by a country that that uh, uses child labor that has no environmental laws that cheats constantly that doesn't allow our goods access to their markets. And you know maybe you'll have to pay for more, more for socks. And I, I'm sorry, and, James's and, uh, friends. That's okay. just the price okay, of business. Okay, but it's not just clothing. It's like technology. I mean, all computers c- come from you know components made in China. Uh, I mean, are you going to pay? Are well, you going to pay twenty five hundred dollars? Why, for why an is iPhone? that, James? Are those people um, in China just such harder workers than Americans? No, they're not. It's because they they have uh, they have uh, an advantage supplied by virtually no environmental regulations, virtually. Um, no child labor law regulations, and uh, you know we we have tons of of trading partners who do follow essentially um, the same kind of rules. You know nobody's proposing huge tariffs on Germany or Japan, um, or really you know even Mexico, other than the the American companies that they go there. I'm, I'm talking about um, you know a giant company that one by one has has closed down thousands and thousands of factories throughout the United States, and. You know this this kind of question in New York. When you say my my friends who own pop up stores, that doesn't reflect when you drive through these states that suddenly went for Trump: Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin. It doesn't reflect these abandoned cities that that don't care how much they pay for socks at Walmart. They they need to focus on their husband having a twenty two dollar job, the 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 wife being able to move up through the ranks of a factory. Is, is there evidence that? Um uh, tariffs being imposed do uh, increase uh, jobs in America. I mean, look, you have you have evidence of of like let's take the in 1929 the Smoot Hawley tariff, which essentially caused the the Great Depression. Like any kind of any kind of sort of government regulation on free trade, I'm afraid, doesn't necessarily lead to an increase in jobs for for kind of the 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 underclasses in the in the flyover states right yeah that's the libertarian viewpoints and and uh, I accept it as a as a valid uh, point of view but what it doesn't account for is you're talking about a, a large tariff like Smoot Hawley what I'm what I'm uh, eager to see is whether even the threat of a large tariff is enough to get a more level platform and that's what we we haven't had we haven't had someone who would full throatedly represent America's interest and unapologetically uh, stand up for the American people and say, we're not going to take this. So like even even in this this Russian hacking that happened, if you read the brilliant Times article about it, detailing it, the even the Democrats are begging Obama, say something, do something, give a, even a press conference like he did when North Korea hacked Sony. And the administration's response was you know, sort of like it always is, cool, level-headed, don't play it up. And they just got bolder and bolder and went from uh, fishing to actually publishing the stuff. It details it beautifully. And so I think this sort of lead from behind strategy we've seen um, over the Obama years uh, has to come to an end. So what, I don't know mean, if what tariffs do you mean is lead the, from behind, like because because uh, you know, on some cases they've uh, you know, the Obama administration has taken a strong stance on, let's say, human rights, and in other cases, maybe not, like in these in these cyber hacking cases. Well, I, if you think the Obama administration is taking a strong stance on human rights, I, I urge you to visit Aleppo right now, which is uh, has joined uh, Srebrenica and uh, Rwanda uh, as sort of the, the infamous cities of, of total destruction. And that's exactly what I mean about lead from behind. Our position in Syria was, look, it's a mess. Every time we get involved in the Middle East, it gets screwed up worse. Let, let's just see how it happens. And what's unfolded is... Uh, hundreds of thousands, nearing 300,000 uh, killed, millions displaced in the greatest human rights disaster in, in the world um, because of our, our quote-unquote strategy to, to do nothing. And when you, when you create a power vacuum, other people come in and do it. In this case, Russia. And now Assad, a uh, great mass murderer, is going to emerge victorious. The rebels will have died. They'll have sent uh, their, their displaced and angry and murderous people all over the world. And it's a total disaster, and so that's what I'm talking about from about leave from behind. So, so do, and, and Trump has expressed both Trump and Bernie Sanders have uh, expressed almost similar isolationist views. Like, why should America be the the police of the world? Uh, where do you, where do you think actually Trump is on this, and what, what do you think will what do you think will happen? You know, I really don't know. I think foreign policy is the is the is the area that that is the most surprising. I mean, uh, I believe when. Obama was running, he had every intention of fulfilling his promise to close Guantanamo Bay. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that you know fits his 
uh, his values, and I think he's a sincere guy and not a liar. And here we are, eight years later, and it's still open um, because I think what happens is you get in the office and you actually learn uh, what the reality is rather than the ideal. So I think foreign policy is the, the single hardest area of a president to, to predict. So I, I don't know uh, where, where Trump's going to fall out on, on but, these things. Okay, so he just, he just selected Rex Tillerson, the CEO of Exxon, uh, to be Secretary of State, which is, an, like, Trump aside, is an interesting pick. Uh, Rex Tillerson obviously has never had foreign policy government experience, but he has immense um, foreign trade experience. And it kind of suggests that, okay, we're, we're, uh, uh, the U.S. is open for business in terms of working out uh you know, favorable trade deals with other countries, favorable commerce deals with other countries, with with Wilbur Ross as Secretary of Commerce. But um, it might. Where, where do you think things change when you put a businessman in that role as opposed to uh, a diplomat in that role? Yeah, you know, I, I think it remains to be seen. I I, I don't know uh, Rex Tillerson's record well enough to to really give you an informed opinion. But I do think it's interesting that it reflects the Trump campaign's values. You know, basically he ran. With this, uh, look, I built this beautiful businesses. I built, uh, you know, businesses all over the world. I'm great at business. So he's someone who, who values that experience. He's not been shy about appointing billionaires who have accomplished a lot um, to these different posts. Um, obviously, he holds the belief that to to do what they've done um, took some skill, and to, uh, that hopefully that skill translates into skill in government. I don't know that that's always been the case um, in in past administrations, but I, I'm willing to 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 give this a shot. Company like Exxon, it, it almost runs as its own country. Their their revenue is about the same as the GDP of South Africa. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's this giant, sprawling, complex uh, enterprise with business all over the world. And you, you know, there'll be a lot of questions raised. I think in the Senate, he'll get a hard time because he's been uh, close to Putin, and that's become very in vogue. And these sort of couple key Republicans like John McCain and Lindsey Graham, who love to see them themselves lauded in the New York Times. Uh, we'll give him a hard time about that relationship, but I, I doubt it'll be fatal to to his candidacy because I think that you can't build a company like Exxon without knowing what you're doing. Yeah, and, and also uh, uh, to give Exxon some credit, there's been a, they do a lot of research on on green energy, alternative energies, and, and so on. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Um, let me ask you about Secretary of Treasury, uh, ex Goldman Sachs guy Stephen. I don't know how to say his last name. Mnuchin. Mnuchin. Um, Mnuchin. It, it's it's basically the the third or fourth Goldman Sachs guy in in recent decades to to hold the position. Is this uh, business as usual in the in the Treasury Department? You know, I I think that there is a case to be made for that. Um, that you know, Goldman Sachs has been this feeder sort of farm team for uh, the presidents of, of both parties in a way that is is definitely off-putting to a lot of Americans who who see it as sort of a shadowy company. But Goldman Sachs is, is sort of the best investment bank we have and has produced a lot of the best talent we have. Um, so Trump's promise was to go get good people, and Mnuchin's a very smart guy and uh, very well qualified to do this. Um, and then, of course, he also, you know, is that guy who, who bet on Trump early um, full forcedly when when few others were willing to, and that's that's how uh, loyalty is built in cabinets. Well, do you think um, you know? Speaking of loyalty, I think uh, you know. Again, he was he was considering Mitt Romney for Secretary of State, and Mitt Romney is somebody who Trump supported early on in 2012, and then Romney, of course, did not support him in this election. Uh, do you think he was just sort of playing with Romney, or was he is was he considering him? Is he still considering him for something? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I don't have any insider insight into that. Um, I, I thought my own personal opinion is that uh, Mitt Romney was way out of bounds in, in his criticism and uh, was obnoxiously doing it in a way to restore personal relevance, which is, is not what a, a party guy does. You know, uh, his, his uh, niece has just gotten a, a major position, um, the head of the RNC, um, she's very talented. Uh, she's been the head of the Michigan GOP in its resurgent year. Um, so, I, you know, that, that box has kind of been checked already. But uh, I personally thought Mitt was way out of bounds um, with his, his take, 
you know, not going to the convention, uh, being just searing in his criticism, calling him a phony and all that. I just, I just don't get it. I, I think it's perfectly valid to, to disagree with Trump. I thought, you know, uh, former President Bush, bo- both former Presidents Bush, um, handled that same point of view in a, a much more dignified way. Um, so, uh, you know, look, if, if Donald Trump thought Mitt Romney would be the best Secretary of State, I, I bet he would have appointed him because he's all about winning and success. And he seems to recover very easily from from you know personal slights as we've seen with other picks, um, but uh, I, I thought Mitt was way out of bounds. Do you think um, there's any chance he's going to reach across the aisles and, and appoint a Democrat to any major positions? I, I don't know. You know that's that's sort of a tradition, right? You usually get you know Secretary of Transportation or, or one of these somewhat politically neutral well, or even uh, with offices. Bill Clinton, Chief of Staff. Uh, you know, with Gergen, yeah, was across the aisles. Well, Clinton, and, you know, uh, also having uh, Morris in there. Um, Clinton, Clinton was a special case because he was, you know, he he won as a triangulator. He nobody, nobody considered that a sellout because his whole appeal was, uh, you know, that Democratic Leadership Council and you know being a, a guy a centrist. So and it's not quite the same. It, it's more surprising when Obama occasionally did it and when uh, George W. Bush occasionally did it, and both of them did. So far, we haven't seen any inclination of that from Donald Trump, but. Look, the guy spent most of his life giving, uh, you know, at least equally, if not predominantly, to Democrats. He has longstanding relationships, and it's odd to to run for president against someone to whom you've been a prolific donor. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if a few Democrats found their way into this administration. Where, where so far, you know, given your early and avid support of him, where so far has he disappointed you? Um. I, you know, even I though think, it's early in the game, to yeah. Say. I mean, I, 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 I'm not disappointed at all with anything he's done since being elected. I think he's he's putting together a great cabinet. Um, I, I approve of all these selections. I think he knows what he's doing. I, I will tell you, um, if uh, just to to smash the notion that I'm somehow un- unwilling or unable to criticize Donald Trump, that the that of all of the scandals that he had during the campaign, most of them I didn't think were anything at all. The one that disappointed me most was when he he suggested that the the judge in the Trump University case couldn't hear the case fairly um, because of his Mexican heritage. I, I thought that was a a uh, unfair and uh, maybe even dangerous uh, point of view. And I hope um, that uh, given some time and uh, you know greater exposure to the judicial process that that he's reconsidered that. but, but and, and you know that that has led to the whole cry of uh, you know, Racism, because it's not only um, do you see people who are supporting, or many of Trump's supporters are kind of known racist. And I agree with the point that just because they support you doesn't mean you support them back. But then you have Trump giving that that clue in this case that the the Mexican judge that he might feel the same way. That that is somewhat disturbing. Yeah, that's exactly why it disturbed me. Look, I I know Donald Trump. Uh, he's not a racist. He's just not. I, I wouldn't support him if he was. But beyond that. You know the the you just if you know him you just know that he's not um, in a way that's that's very hard to spell out in uh, in a way to people who don't know him you just you kind of know among your friends and among the people you know who who secretly harbors hatred in their heart and he doesn't so I'm not worried about him being a racist at all but um, I thought that 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 particular take on on the judge. Um, was just was just wrong. Uh, it's not the American way. It's not how we evaluate people. Well, why do you think? Uh, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna call this the the media. But why do you think there are so many calls that Trump is an anti semite? Given I mean, he's you know, Jared Kushner's Orthodox Jewish. His his grandchildren are Orthodox Jews. Uh, why why are people? I I actually again naive question. Maybe I'm missing something. Where is the anti-Semitism? There isn't coming any. From? There, the, it, it, it comes Where is the charge coming from? It, it comes from because people are full of shit. There is no uh, anti-Semitism there. Look, I, I've seen this guy twice hold his grandson at a bris. Um, you know, it's 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 just ridiculous, and it's it's dangerous to call everybody an anti-Semite all the time, and it's dangerous to call people racists all the time because there are actual anti-Semites in the world. There are actual racists, and you know, in a in a boy cried wolf situation like this. It, it deadens the sensibilities of a great democracy here. And we, we can't just scream every time somebody uses, oh, that star had this many points on it, not that many. It, that's ridiculous. You know, I, this, this topic incenses me, James. I, for a year, um, in 2014, 
uh, I wrote every, every week to, to the irritation, I'm sure, of, of my bosses. I wrote editorials decrying the Iran deal and, and saying this is an existential threat to the, to the Jewish homeland, to the, the majority of the world's Jewish population. And nobody, nobody gave a shit at all. No, nobody cared. I couldn't get people interested. I, I won Jewish Journalist of the Year uh, for that, and yet real people couldn't care less including all these people who are outraged because this, this star has this many points or because this guy who ran a website who pro- published one article that said one thing gets to be in the administration. It's ridiculous. I, I pay almost no attention to these little minor things. You know, I'm 48 years old. Since I'm a little kid, every time uh, the, the, you know, there's a, a swastika painted on a tombstone in a Jewish cemetery or something, I expect the brown shirts to like bust through my door any second. That, that's how I'm built. That's, that's who I am. So this stuff, these little minor things where, where idiots basically act like idiots, that's been happening forever, for literally since the history of the Jewish people. What's, what's new in this world is stuff like uh, Iran becoming a nuclear power. And that's where I expect a, a strong leader like Donald Trump, who, um, who criticized that deal more, more ferociously than anybody, that's where I expect him to do some good in the world. So, so explain, explain what was wrong with that, that deal to me. Just again... Um, you know, on the surface, uh, okay, we're going to release some sanctions and they're going to get rid of 98% of their nuclear material. What's what's the bad part? This is so frustrating to me because... Um, and and I, I, if I'm saying that, if I'm yeah. saying this, that means most people don't know what the bad no, part I, is. I just, it, it, it's, so, it's so painful to me because it's it's a done deal. You know, now, now Boeing's going to sell $40 billion worth of planes to them and... I, you know, people talk about don't normalize Donald Trump. I- I'm saying don't normalize Iran, which is currently today. This isn't some theory about what it's going to do. They brutally put down uh, the the opposite political party. I mean, with with mm-hmm. murder. Mm-hmm. Um, they 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 the the globe's leading sponsor of state sponsored terrorism. They they funded the uh, the Assad regime. I mean, this is they they are currently right now today threatening. Uh, Israel through their proxies in Hezbollah and Hamas. So this isn't like a theoretical threat. This is a, a real threat that is actually killing real people and making a dangerous region an impossibly dangerous region. But was there a danger that with the nuclear material they had that they could have developed? Yes, or? absolutely. But the, the right question isn't to say, okay, let's let you continue to develop and stall it by 10 years. The right answer is to say, we've got you trapped. You're, you're at the, your own two-yard line and you know it's it's fourth and twenty five, and we just gave you a first down. So now you're at the thirty five yard line um, instead of the two. Um, and I hate to use sports analogies because it trivializes a very uh, desperate situation. But the fact is, Iran was was this close. And again, uh, listeners, I'm holding my forefinger and thumb very close to one another in what Tom Wolf would describe as the universal gesture of being very close. So Iran was this close to being suffocated and finally getting its people who are who are very well educated and our readers and um, it's a uh, secular a, population. Uh, it's largely. a secular population with a great history of of science and and art and math. They were this close to being able to to stage an actual revolution, and that's that's what I'm talking about with uh, Obama leading from behind. When he had the chance to support an actual, you know, revolution for the good guys, he passed. It wasn't until uh, Egypt, when, <laughs> when the good guys were were revolting, that he said, "No, not so fast. Let's support the Muslim Brotherhood." And that, I just can't understand this whole lead from behind strategy that results in the Iran deal, that results in doing nothing in Syria, that results in opposing the people in Egypt who who were reasonable and have proven themselves now. Thank God they won and are proving themselves to be running a pretty realistic, you know, forward-looking country. Now, in terms of this lead from behind versus lead from the front, uh, let's say Trump's a lead from the front type of guy, but he's also said, "Listen, if we're going to go out there in the world and and bring our military, uh, other NATO countries have to foot the bill as well." Uh, what if the other countries don't foot the bill? Are we just going to stay home? Or again, I'm actually pretty isolationist myself, but that's not usually how it works out in practice. Well, that's like your China question. I, I think what we've got in Donald Trump is is someone who, like Ronald Reagan, uh, you know, when Gorbachev looked in his eyes, he famously said, I knew he meant it. And I think that's what you've got with Donald Trump, that what we've had now is just the other countries go, well, I won't honor my commitment to put 2% of my GDP into defense. We'll just have America cover the balance. And when Trump says, we're not going to do that anymore, I think they believe it. So I don't think we're going to get to a point where we won't protect, uh, you know, a NATO ally from an invasion. 
I think what, what will start to happen is these other countries will start ponying up the money that they've committed to for uh, 70 years now. Or what if uh, China calls one of these countries and says, hey, we'll, um, we'll start supporting your military and we'll start doing deals with you. Like, are, are we, is there any kind of um, resetting of the chips happening around the world if, if we kind of pull out of supporting certain countries? Yeah, I think there, there will be a realignment, but you see that with every president. We're, you know, we're closer to some and less close to others. I mean, I, I never thought we'd see you know, Cuba become virtually an ally of the United States during my lifetime. And, and that's, a, uh, in my view, a, a success of the Obama administration. So you see realignments constantly as, as the world changes. I mean, it's hard to say. It's hard to say, though. This is my point always, and I'm curious your opinion on it. What, what effect is that of Obama or just the fact that Castro basically got so old he couldn't lead the country and now he's dead? And, you know, just the world changing in, in due course anyway, regardless of who's president. That's exactly right, James. It's, it's you know, uh, I think Winston Churchill joked that the, the one thing you can't plan for in politics is the news. And that, that changes things. Um, you know, if I, Fidel Castro was in his 90s, so it was inevitable that, that he was going to die. But there could have been an even, you know, an even stronger strong man instead of his brother, who is more uh, sort of Western friendly. There, there could have been, who knows, uh, who could have come in there. So you can't plan for everything. But um, we do our best to elect someone who, who will represent most of American interests mostly well. So, so what, what, like, again, I mean, we were talking before the podcast started, uh, and again, I'm largely apolitical, but I see it on both sides of my Facebook feed. Uh, it's just like a shitstorm out there. Everyone's angry. Everyone's yelling at each other. Everyone's defriending each other. This this particular race seemed to be more divisive than any than even the Bush Gore two thousand. Like I've never seen anything like this. It's it's been kind of insane. Just you can't even talk to people one way or the other. Yeah, it's it's, it's a really troubling phenomenon of this race. I I don't know. You know, I'm a I'm a student of American history and looking back to when these guys like actually shot each other sometimes. Like, you know, go out to Weehawken and have a duel. Um, I don't know that it is truly the most divisive in American history, but it's it's right up there, and it, it is a shame. And the the social media phenomenon to which you allude is real. Um, I try very hard on my own. Uh, I'm not on Twitter, and that's on purpose because it's just so angry and so nasty. And on Facebook, where you at least have better control over uh, who you communicate with, um, I try really hard not to not to get into politics. Um, but, but it's all very smart people on both sides. Like, what 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 is the main argument? You know, again, he's elected, so now it's. I don't say it's an obligation to let's see what happens and uh, let him take his best shot. But like, why aren't people on on again on either side willing to say, hey, let's all figure out how how unity can happen here. Yeah, I, I'm not sure why that is. I, I think we're we're really waiting for a, a sort of a, a great uniter type either candidate like a Reagan or incident like a September 11th because I, I just don't see how, how we're going to get together and act as one. Like already, you know, I mean, the guy's not, he's 30 days from being sworn in and Paul Krugman, who cried and whined like a little bitch for months about whether Donald Trump was going to accept the results of the election. Now he's already calling Donald Trump the illegitimate president. And you've got, you know, websites like the Daily Beast that have, have just decided that uh, every single day they're just going to pound him um, with every single article. And it, it just, to me, it's it's like there's no chance for us to even start uh, uh, on the same page. I mean, even Barack Obama, who who was elected amid some some very nasty campaigning, both in his primary and then uh, in in the general in 08. Um, at least he started amid a, a true crisis, financial crisis. And I think there was a lot of hope, even among people who didn't vote for him, that this transformative uh, president who, who was younger and didn't look like other presidents was was going to do things differently. Um, that, that dissipated fairly quickly um, when Obamacare became such a divisive issue. But Trump doesn't even seem to be getting that, you know, sort of six-month honeymoon, and it's it's disappointing. So, okay, uh, you mentioned Obamacare. I forgot to ask about that. What's going to happen to Obamacare? Well, I hope it's dismantled. Um, but but, now, but know, Trump's was, already alluded he's not going to yep, totally dismantle. No, I, I, that's right. I, I think there's a lot of this, well, we'll keep the good parts, but th the problem with that is that the reason those good parts weren't in the in there in the first place is those they had to be in there as sweeteners to pay for this incredibly unaffordable, gigantic, sprawling, and now failing bureaucracy. I mean, I mean, people are just starting to get their health bills 
um, for, for coverage and are realizing that this is totally unsustainable. You can't have 15, 20% average increases with some as, you know, as high as 30 and 40%. Obviously, you know, after a year or two, that's, that's unsustainable. So the, the whole premise of Obamacare that, um, that young, healthy people are going to sign up and pay voluntarily, th- that never seemed realistic to me. That, that seemed like a, a typical idealistic uh, just, just notion that wasn't based in reality. I mean, you, you stand on any corner and watch people smoke and do like what I do is, you know, eat disgusting things and have milkshakes. And people don't, don't take care of their best interests. They're, they're just not rational in that way. So this assumption that they would suddenly say, oh, I barely have $300 in my pocket. Why don't I just spend it on health care when I feel super healthy and feel like I'm going to live forever? It wasn't ever realistic. So, but you do see now, uh, since the election, a sharp rise in signups for Obamacare because people are worried that, uh, you know, it'll be dismantled before they get a chance to get their their year of of cheaper health insurance. Yeah, well, it's not going to be dismantled overnight. That's that's mm-hmm. not not possible. And, you know, I thought Trump was actually quite merciful uh, during the Republican primaries when everybody was racing to say how fast they take it apart. He he was the one who who took the the sort of more centrist position of saying we don't want people sick in the streets. No one wants that, and that's that's just not sustainable for any president. It's not not going to be dismantled overnight. But Obamacare is, a, is uh, by my lights, a totally failing system. It, it needs to be uh, either replaced by a free market system, which is essentially what we had, but but with you know without these crazy uh, you know state by state regulations. You know, let the free market handle it, um, or a single payer system like um, you know like like Canada has, which would I would I would despise even more than Obamacare. But but this middle ground is is clearly failing. So so. Before the podcast started, we were talking about what's going on with the New York Observer. You're one of the first. I mean, I I've loved the New York Observer ever since I moved to New York City in 1994. It was this big pink paper. I would just spread out on like a diner table and read it. Now the print version you guys have recently announced is dead. Uh, it's digital only. Um, how's it going? It's going great. We we had about seven times the traffic in. Uh, in the last month of the of the existence of the print New York Observer, uh, on we had seven times the online traffic as we did in the first month that I got here. We went from three million page views to twenty. We went from the thirty six hundredth um, biggest website in the country to two hundred seventy fifth. So uh, you know, I my my job, my goal in life is to deliver great writing and thoughtful ideas and strong points of view through whichever medium people people want it and they're they're voting with their feet you know people were not reading the paper edition and they they're reading the um the website like crazy so that's that's where we're, we're, we're going to reach them this is obviously it's it's so obvious that this is a conversation that every single newspaper in the country is going to have the wall street journal just killed its uh metro section the daily news looks like a uh a comic book at this point it's so small the, even even like uh you know, big financial magazines like Forbes are about half the size yeah, exactly. that they used to be. That's exactly, and that's in boom times. You know, that's what the dial was soaring. You, you remember during internet, uh, the first internet boom in 1999, they, there was whole magazines invented, and they looked like phone books, like Industry Standard and Red Herring, Yeah, just to accommodate all the print ads. Now we're in sort of another boom, at least the stock market boom, and, uh, you know, nobody needs that. Um, nobody needs that print delivery uh, vehicle because that's not where people are consuming it. So look, I'm I'm old fashioned myself. I, w- I would have loved it if if our consumers kept buying that that uh, print New York Observer every week, um, but they weren't. So I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna you know continue to. I, I want to spread our resources on on great journalism and deliver that journalism however people want it, not just like oh it's I've decided we're printing you know we're printing on a stone tablet, so everyone has to get a stone tablet. It's just not how it goes. So so um, again, just just real briefly back to to Trump. Uh, you know, one of the main things I guess people are worried about are judges. So you know, he's got a Supreme Court justice to a point. I know he's looking at something like twenty plus uh, potential you know candidates for this. Uh, do you think Trump is serious about his kind of pro life anti gay marriage stance, or do you think that might have just been campaign talk, or where, where do you think we go there? Well, I think that he was actually on the gay gay uh, marriage thing. I think he was pretty clear in saying uh, that's a settled decision. It was it was settled by the Supreme Court and it doesn't need to be revisited. So I'll take exception with your characterization. Oh, all right, you're there. right. And actually, he repeated that on, on 60 Minutes. He said that's a done deal. I'm not going to touch it. 
Yeah, um, with pro life, um, yeah, I think he's serious about it. I think he'll appoint pro life judges. That's that's an incredibly important issue to the to the this giant section of the the people who got him elected. I don't think it's a I, I don't think it's a negotiable issue. Um, and I think that's you know he took the very unusual step of of releasing a list of people he'd consider. And that list was considered was widely considered very thoughtful and very strong, even by conservatives like Paul Ryan, who who often criticized Donald Trump. So I'd be very surprised if you know some some sort of uh, Stevens type guy, you know, sort of strolls his way in and makes it who wasn't on that list. Do you think uh, Trump and Paul Ryan will continue having a good uh, relationship? You think he'll have a good relationship overall with Congress? Well, I you know I think Donald Trump is a guy who's proven throughout his business career that that he's more about getting the job done um, than about uh, you know nursing these these grudges to the to the grave. I I, I think that the characterization of him um, is just so strange. The Mitt Romney one you you brought up is a good example, and Rick Perry's just been appointed to to Energy Secretary. Um, Perry was very critical of Trump. He's he's sort of shown that he's going to put people in place who he thinks will do the job. Um, you know, rather than than, you know, keep these keep these uh, grudge battles alive. So I hope that his relationship with uh, Speaker Ryan is strong. That's very important, and even in bipartisan times. I mean, the you know the Tip O'Neill Ronald Reagan relationship was key to a lot of things that that just about everybody agrees uh, were great about the 1980s. So uh, I think though some Republicans might be angling towards 2020, where they see okay. We're going to give Trump a few months potentially to see if he can start executing things. Else, we're going to start gunning for him, putting him down, and then we're putting ourselves in place for 2020. And I can see Paul Ryan uh, taking that stance. You you think that they'd run for president? Yeah. Against income? It's, that's far-fetched. I mean, that's happened on occasion, but it's always with an insurgent candidate like a Ronald Reagan against a Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford hadn't been elected. He You know, he had been vice president. Ronald Reagan wasn't... Uh, and then Ted Kennedy versus office. Jimmy Carter in yeah, 1980. That's, that's the Democrats. That's a different... Mm-hmm. You know, the Republicans have this very orderly, you know, wait in line uh, type of way to do things. It's, it's, it's something that have to go seriously, seriously wrong with the Trump presidency, which is possible um, for that to happen. But if it went so wrong, it's just almost impossible to picture the Republican winning uh, in that situation. So I don't know that it'd be... You know, real desperation to have that nomination. Okay, so prediction. You made a prediction in uh, two years ago. What's your prediction for the Democrats four years from now? Who's who's in line? You know, I can't talk about four years from now because you got to look at the the midterms. It's very hard for an incumbent president to hold on to a majority if he's got it when he comes in. Um, so the Democrats ought to be looking to to eighteen as their big chance to put some pain on the Republican Party. That's why it was so baffling to me. That they, you know, their leaders of the party are the same. Old, I couldn't believe that Nancy Pelosi won. I mean, I, <laughs> how does she win? Win? This is a year they should have had major pickups. You know, um, Charles Schumer will be uh, an effective minority leader in the Senate, but he's again, he's a, he's a get along guy. Um, the all of the energy in the Democratic Party is in the sort of the, the Bernie Sanders wing, and none of those people seem to have been rewarded at the DNC at the. Uh, in Congress and the Senate, um, and even to have Joe Biden still talking about himself as presidential candidate for for twenty, it, it's stunning to me. I mean, it, it's it's unbelievable to me that the whole energy of the wing, the whole insurgent uh, side of the Democratic Party, has to come from a seventy two year old in the first place. You know, what where's are, their wh- next Barack Obama? Where where's that guy? Okay, uh, I'll throw out a name. Like, what about Cory Booker in Newark? Uh I don't think Cory Booker was a good mayor of Newark, um, so uh, I I don't know what you know what record he's got to run on uh, in his defense as as a senator. It's very tough in the minority in the Senate to get much done. So the fact that he has zero s- signature legislation is kind of not his fault because few minority senators, and I mean minority party, not not uh, minority race, you know, can ever can ever really break through the noise. Um, that's just the way the Senate is is set up. Um, uh, but I, I mean, Cory Binder is a, a Cory Booker is a great speaker, uh, and uh, you know, a great orator. But y- you got to have something more than that to run on. And you look at the state of of Newark, which I spend time in a couple times a week, and it's 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 actually now finally under its new mayor on the upswing a little bit. But Why man, you spend it's so just, much time in Newark. <laughs> um, well, I I. Uh, 
Just like I have my there. kids half the time, James, if you must know, and your listeners are super interested in my personal life. I have my kids half the time, and when, so when I'm not in New York, um, I have a place in New Jersey, so I can try and raise them a little bit. And today is my son's 15th birthday. I should throw that out there. Um, I don't well, know that this will, to him. this will air to, on the same day we're recording it, but I, I do want to note it. Well, I will let you get to your son's birthday. And one final question. Donald Trump calls you today and says, Ken... Uh, you've been such a great supporter. I trust your advice. Uh, I want you to be ambassador to India or something. Do you say yes? You know, if the president calls you, you, you can't you can't easily turn him down. I the the truth is, uh, I have been discussed for for various roles. Um, like what? And I I prefer not to say. Um, uh, but I've got my dream job. I love what I'm doing. Um, I take it seriously. I I, I love what we're building at the Observer. Um, and uh, you know, you you can't. But you can't kind of play both sides. I'm I'm flattered to be considered. Um, it's nice to be thought of that way. Um, but you know, barring a call from the president elect himself saying that your country needs you, suit up. Um, I'm I'm happy where I am. Well, thanks, Ken, once again for coming on the podcast. Super appreciate it, and it gave me a lot of insightful information. And so I hope uh, listeners appreciate it as well. James, what a treat to see you always. Next time on the James Altucher Show. My happiness and my quality of life is much more important than cashing out some money on a business. I, I didn't care anymore. I wanted to be happy again. But, you know, most people wouldn't have the confidence to say, okay, I'm also going to do something I never did before, which is travel around the world. And at the same time, I'll be able to m- make a living. Americans don't understand how insanely expensive it is to live in the U.S. I did the math on this. I'm kind of depressed listening to this. So why, do, uh, uh, give me another excuse. Why don't people do this? I mean, I'm getting ready. To, um, I, I feel like packing myself right now. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money, despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.